All right. Um, we're going to talk about uh, gases some more today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about equilibrium of gases. Um, word of warning, my head's a little fuzzy today. I, when I get migraines, I they don't hurt so much as just stuff stops making sense and I can't speak coherently. Um, so if I say something that seems like it doesn't make sense, please raise your hand. Ask me if I said what I meant to say. Um, just to, would appreciate that. That'll that'll go a long way. I should be able to be fine for lecture and everything. If I, um, just a little disclaimer that it might actually be me, not you, not understanding this time. Um, just to switch things up. All right. So some uh, some quiz questions from last Tuesday's quiz. Uh, somebody asked about half lives and how how logs show up in um, in complicated problems. And those are actually related to each other. There's a lot of applications for where logs show up um, in sciences, um, not least of which because we live in a universe where we might, in chemistry in particular, often studies things that go from really, really, really small to really, really, really big. Um, if you get into astronomy, you're still looking at chemistry and things like that just at the scale of an entire sun or an entire planet at once. Um, and when you, anytime you've got scales that vary that much, log-based scales can be useful that way as a way to kind of like, okay, every time um, it's log-based scales are a lot like using scientific notation, just in a sort of a shorthand way of doing scientific notation. Instead of saying that the moon is, um, you know, is one times 10 to the 24 kilograms, you could say if we're using a log-based mass system, we could just say 24, because really what matters most is that unit and the power that's on, on the... Um, exponent there uh, so it you know logs show up a lot of the places the reason i tied that to half-lives is because one of the places that the the term half-life usually gets used with respect to nuclear chemistry um but it turns out that any reaction called in that's a, of a type called a first order reaction which basically means that it happens that every molecule in a system every reactant molecule in a system has like a set probability of a reaction happening at any given time. So it's a little bit like, um, like I don't know, rolling dice. If you roll dice and if you have like say a hundred dice and you roll them and every time you get a six, you take that six out. Does the number of dice affect the probability of any single die turning it, coming up six? They don't interact with each other really if it's a first order process. And that means that you actually wind up with, um, we can predict how much of something we have based on a constant, the time and the amount that we started with, ln. So this is this is a, a uh, equation called an integrated rate law that basically looks at at how fast reactions happen, specifically first order reactions. Um, and actually, and if you'll notice, this has logs in it, right? Natural log, not log base ten, but still logs, which means we can rearrange it a little bit with laws of logs to say amount of a am over the amount of a initially is equal to minus k times time. What this means is if you wind up with being able to combine these, um, depending on the, not depending on the units, um, you, can, you can wind up looking at it in terms of a half-life because a half-life just means that our current concentration of A is half of what we started for, right? So if, you have a, if your current concentration of half of, is of what you started for, we could write it as natural log of 0 0.5 times A naught over a naught equals minus kt. And usually to indicate we're talking about a half-life, we put t one half. What do you notice about this fraction? 
could simplify it, right? So in other words, then we wind up with natural log of, of 0 0.5 equals a constant times the half-life. In other words, for a first order reaction, it doesn't matter how much you start with, the half-life doesn't change. So if it takes, say, the half-life of carbon-14, the half-life of carbon-14 is about 5,700 years. So that means after 5,700 years, you have half what you started with. After another 5,700 years, you have half of that. Left. So you wind up with this sort of exponential decay where every 5,700 years, you cut what you had in half. And so you wind up with this asymptote where if you look at time versus your concentration, it's just gradually approaching zero. Um, and every so often, it's half of what you started with. I even managed to make that almost to scale. That's actually not half bad. Um, half of what you started with at one half-life, half of that at two half-lives, half of that at three half-lives. And so that only works for first order processes. Um, and there's a lot of chemical reactions that are first order reactions, but the ones that have a really long half-life where, where this process happens over a really long period of time tend to be nuclear reactions. The half-lives for a lot of first order reactions that we would do in the lab might be in the seconds, um, in which case that just means that, okay, if we keep this going, yes, we'll get more product, but you kind of get this diminishing returns at some point where, yeah, we could boil it for another hour, but we're only going to get 1% more yield if we do that. Um, because really in those cases, we're not approaching zero, we're actually approaching equilibrium. And so we might not actually get to 100% yield no matter how much time we give it. But anyway, uh, so a bit of a digression. We will talk about more about nuclear chemistry in a week or two. Um, so after gases, we're going to talk about condensed phase matter, which is solids and liquids, and we'll talk about phase change. Um, and that's actually kind of a, a really cool uh, chapter just because we deal with phase change all the time in everyday life, right? Ice melting, water evaporating, water condensing. Um, this might not mean quite so much to you as I don't think any of you are yourselves homeowners yet, but I've heard... Um, Home ownership is one man's fight against water in all of its various forms. All you're really doing is trying to like, you paint the side of the house so that it doesn't soak up water from the snow. You paint, you know, you seal the garage so that water doesn't come in when the snow melts. You, you know, the, you take care of the roof so that you don't get leaks. You take care of the pipes so that the pipes don't leak. Um, and so water in general is really important, obviously, and phase change plays a big role in a lot of that. That saying really hit home today because I noticed that my daughter's been hanging her swimsuit up um, on the um, on a towel rack in the bathroom. And it's been, but she hangs it up when it's still dripping, and so now we have to replace the baseboards because they're all warped and waterlogged and things like that. So I was thinking a lot about home ownership being a fight against water today. When I realized that at seven in the morning, um, the zombie apocalypse. That's more fun. Zombie apocalypse question. This is a great question because um, if the zombie apocalypse were actually to occur, what would be the most likely scientific cause? Parasites. Um, they're actually already, we already know of lots of different parasites, parasitic organisms that live in the brains or, in, or can affect the behavior of their horse, host organisms. Um, for instance, there's a species of, um, of ant that when it gets a particular parasite, the parasite, it's, I think that one's a fungus, um, drives the ant to climb to the top of a, of a blade of grass and just hang on for dear life at the top of the blade of grass because the parasite actually wants to get eaten by, by a ruminant, by a cow or a goat. And it has a better chance of getting eaten by a cow or a goat if it's at the top of a blade of grass. So it basically hijacks the ant and uses the ant to get it to the top of the blade of grass. Um, there's also some other ones. There's a species of hornet 
that actually when it's it stings cockroaches this is, i think this is in southeast asia um it stings a cockroach's brain and floods it with with dopamine and gaba um which is another neurotransmitter and then just uses the antenna to steer it back to its nest so that its larva can eat the cockroach um and it does that by controlling its behavior so nature's scary and actually one that happens all the time has everybody heard of toxoplasmosis um, is a parasite that the final stage of its life cycle is in the digestive tract of cats. Um, but it gets spread by other mammals carrying it. It's relatively harmless, but it, it basically makes small mammals less afraid of predators. So basically, if you're, if you're a parasite that wants to get eaten by a cat and you can live in a mouse, the behavior that's going to make it more likely for a, you to get into the cat's digestive system is if you make the, the mouse less afraid of a cat. So it basically just totally reverses normal mouse behavior um, to entice the mouse to not be worried about getting eaten. Um, and that one's, that one's probably the single most um, ubiquitous parasite like that. It's estimated something like 30, 30 to 50% of all humans worldwide have that um, parasite. It doesn't really cause any issues for humans unless you're a baby or very, very old or immunocompromised, which is why people that have HIV or other immunocompromised um, or other autoimmune disorders can't have cats because just changing the litter box can actually cause you to get infected. And it is life threatening if you're immunocompromised or if you're a uh, newborn. So how does zombie apocalypse happen? almost guaranteed if that happens, it's parasites. Something figured out a way to, or evolved a way to change our behavior to cause us to behave a certain way. Um, and, a, and all it's really trying to do is cause that parasite to reproduce more. Um, last but not least, an astronomy one. Do black holes have an ending? Yes, actually. This is actually what Stephen Hawking, I don't think he won a Nobel Prize for it. He won a Fields Medal maybe a Nobel Prize, um, but it's called Hawking radiation. Um, basically, Stephen Hawking showed mathematically um, and theoretically that black holes should be surrounded by small amounts of radiation that would show up as heat on our telescopes. Um, but if that's happening, if you wind up with this, with this Hawking radiation giving off heat, that actually means that if you follow the conservate law of conservation of energy and mass all the way through, that the black holes are constantly losing mass as a result of giving off this Hawking radiation, which means if you waited long enough, a black hole, they call it evaporating, a black hole will evaporate um, given enough time. We're talking, you know, millions and billions of years, but black holes don't last forever in theory. They will also, and I think, I think we have some evidence that they found that looks like a small black hole evaporating. They can actually um, map the, the temperature of the black hole, the surface of the black hole, and it matches up with Stephen Hawking's series. Uh, similar, except it's going to become when it's, it's being emitted entirely as radiation, as light. Um, but because light is, or energy is just another form of mass from Einstein's equation, um, basically that the energy that it gives off takes away from its mass. It's not actually losing mass directly. Some of the mass of the black hole is being converted directly 100% to energy, which then shows up as light. Um, so it's not like the mass itself would recollect at another point. It's more like the mass just disappears and we get more energy in the universe as a result. It, it would, in theory, get to the point where it wouldn't, it would continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller. I don't know the astrophysics well enough to know if it ever stops being a black hole before it completely disappears or if it keeps its density so that it's just like, it's a black hole one second and then it's gone the next. Or if it goes from being a black hole to being something like a neutron star once it sheds enough mass. Um, I, I'm fuzzy on the 
on the astrophysics of that part. Um, but just to answer that question, we can conclusively say black holes have an end. Logan? Everywhere, anywhere. Where does the where does the light go from our sun if it misses our planet? It does. So, if you look at this, what they call the event horizon of the black hole, which is the point where is where light can't escape anymore. If light goes past the event horizon of a black hole. It actually, its path actually gets curved because just like anything else, like you picture rolling a marble on a curved surface, the marble sort of rolls towards that lowest point, right? Photons do the same thing around a black hole. If it happens to hit the event horizon, it gets sucked in and that end is gone. That's why we call it a black hole. Once the light's in there, the light, the light's own mass is being basically trapped in some sort of I don't, we don't know what happens inside the event horizon, but you could think of it just like being it's trapped in orbit around the black hole and it'll never get out again. Um, right at the surface of the event horizon though, it turns out what Hawking figured out is that, is it constantly just in vacuum. Vacuum has its own energy to it. Just empty space has its own energy where you can constantly have, um, antimatter generate where you wind up with basically from nothing you get an electron and what's called a positron which is an electron with a positive charge which is the smallest form of antimatter usually since they're opposite charges they just recombine and turn back into energy this takes some energy from the surroundings to do this though and then if they recombine the energy just goes back into the surroundings if that happens right at the surface of um, an event horizon, there's a small chance that the electron gets sucked in, but the positron doesn't. And that will sh that shows up as there's extra energy all of a sudden just outside the event horizon. So it's not actually the light from inside the black hole that shows up as Hawking radiation. It's this randomly generated um, uh, these, I think they call them anti matter antimatter pairs that show up. And when the matter antimatter pair is no longer paired up, it shows that we can visualize, see it, and measure it as form in the form of energy. Because if this positron doesn't hit this, this electron, it'll hit something else and turn back into energy as well. But you wind up as in general with this whole process causing the black hole to lose energy slowly. Um, maybe if, you, if you look up, if you just Google or take your search engine of choice um, and look up black hole evaporation um, and Hawking radiation or Hawking radiation, there's some pretty good explanations out there. I think Professor Dave has a good explanation of Hawking radiation and black holes. Um, if I'm remembering properly, if he doesn't, we should, because he could explain it better than I just did. Yeah. Nope. We've never gotten anything close enough to a black hole. Um, but in theory, you go through a process as you approach that event horizon. Um, you go through a process called spaghettification. Um, which is when the, the amount of gravity on the bottom of your body is more than the, the amount of gravity on the top half because you're that close to something so massive. And so you, they call it spaghettification because they visualize it as objects get pulled into like spaghetti-like shapes. Um, but you would never actually notice that because the other thing that's happening on the surface of a, bla of a black hole is that time stops on an event horizon. When you get to a t the event horizon, time behaves very, very differently because there's so much mass that it warps the fabric of space time to the point that there isn't a before cause and effect doesn't apply um, when you're on an event horizon. Basically, time doesn't exist. It's not time stops. Time doesn't exist 
um, which is really weird to think about. It's like you could have an effect happen before a cause, but it cannot before a cause. It's really just happening simultaneously because time doesn't exist. Um, so uh, event horizons and singularities is the general, more general term. Um, it behaves like there's an asymptote in space time. And when you have that discontinuity, it causes time to be really, really weird, along with everything else that gets really, really weird. You have to take more physics, but, but that's, that's what relativity is. Relativity is the idea that if you're, if you have two, two stopwatches moving at different speeds relative to each other, they will measure time differently based on how fast they're going relative to each other. Um, and they actually showed this, they brought us, they brought an atomic watch onto the international space station, which is traveling fast enough relative to the surface of the earth that it's what's called a relativistic speed, meaning relativity matters. Um, and the watch that was on the International Space Station um, over the course of a year, I think it had like it had lost three seconds over the course of a year. But it's, it's not going at the exact same speed. And if you get things really, really heavy and you get one of those singularities, it gets even weirder and time just ceases to exist or exists all at once. That's, we don't even have the language. Our language is built around cause and effect, right? We don't have the words to describe how that actually behaves. Yeah. <laughs> Taj and then Logan. The, the time you would perceive time moving at the same pace, but when you got back, oh, let's, so let's say you go on a spaceship and you go out at 90% the speed of light, and then you come back. You will have, and if you were gone for a year by your clock, it might have been 20 years on Earth. Uh, has anybody seen or read the movie Ender's Game? I don't know if they, had, if they addressed it in the movie. I never saw the movie. Um, but that's what they do with their, their greatest military mind, right? Mazer Rackham gets put onto a spaceship, sent off into relativistic speeds, and come back so that he's still alive to teach Ender how to be a, you know, a genius. Um, but that's, it, that's how it actually behaves. The faster you're going relative to a stationary frame of reference, the slower time moves for you. And you don't even notice it until you get back. There's no way of telling that it's going differently for you because you're moving at the same speed as your watch. Logan? So if you were to just go sit on like an event horizon uh, by a singularity, your time would still be perceived the same as you affects you when you come back. So when you hit the singularity aspect, that's when we don't know. So we don't know if, and, and like I said, we just, we don't even have the language to describe it really. Would you perceive time stopping? Would it just, would, or would it be like, you know, you, you get closer and closer to the event horizon or from your perception, would you never actually reach the event horizon? Like every year you get halfway there and you never actually truly reach it. So it just you just perceive it as a never ending approach of the event horizon. Like we don't we don't know what that would look like. Things break down in singularity. Yeah. You would you would basically stop aging relative to something further away from the black hole. Um, and uh, Interstellar does a pretty good job of it too, right? The guy that they leave on the spaceship when they go down to the, the tidal wave planet, um, when they get back, he's 20 years older and they were, oh, they, they were only gone for five minutes or an hour or something like that. That's pretty, that's accurate scientifically to how a planet like that would behave and how time would behave. Tosh? So it's pretty well established. We, where it breaks, where it might break down is, is getting that close to an actual singularity. Other than a black hole, yeah, relativity is a real thing. Time dilation is a real thing. Um, if it wasn't, we actually have to take it into account in GPS satellites. GPS satellites would be, have the wrong location if they didn't take into account the fact that they were traveling significantly faster than the surface of the Earth. 
which is weird. But yeah, we have to take that into account or we get the wrong answer from your from your Google Maps and things like that. All right, a couple more relative relevant questions. Um, if you want to know more about black holes, take more physics because we are rapidly approaching the event horizon of my knowledge. Um, and uh, at which point I just have to start speculating and talking about sci-fi more. Um, why is pH super harmful for humans? Basically, the proteins that make up your cells and everything in your body start to fall apart if you change the pH too much, too high or too low. Basically, all of the forces that keep those proteins folded up just right um, get, get de they use the term denatured. It, so they just wind up basically turning into useless molecules that don't do anything. Um, and so it's the same thing that heat does, though, as well. That's why I call it a chemical burn or an acid burn. It's literally the same thing that exposing your, your protein to extreme heat does. It just breaks apart all the proteins so that they can't hold their shape anymore, which usually kills the cells. Um, related, why do different plants grow better at different pH levels? Same, same thing. Different plants are adapted to different pH levels based on what environment they evolved in. Um, and sometimes actually as a competition mechanism, as a, a defense mechanism. Um, our soil up here in Tahoe, especially underneath pine trees, is really, really acidic because pine needles, um, when they soak in water, they leach tannins and other weak acids into the soil. But in very few deciduous plants can grow in acidic soil, which is why if you go into the forest, there's all very, very little actually grows underneath the pine trees. Uh, and that's predominantly because pine trees and conifers in general are adapted to live in better um in more acidic soil and so they they're kind of keeping out the interlopers by just keeping the soil a little more acidic so it's partly it's an evolved issue and sometimes it's just that's how they find their niche their niche um you get an ecological niche because nothing else grows there eventually something will figure out how to grow there will evolve the way to grow there and once they do they're going to be better at surviving in that particular ph than other places um, same is true with salinity levels. If you look at how much salt is in water, different organisms grow better in different types of water because they can handle or tolerate or evolve to succeed despite the salinity, um, similar to pH. Stuff that's even more relevant. What's the purpose of the 5% rule? How do we know if that assumption when we're doing our ice tables is valid? Um, the 5% is basic, is somewhat arbitrary. Like in, in what we mean by that is that is X less than 5% of the initial concentration. Um, there's not really a, a specific reason why it has to be 5%. That's just kind of the agreed upon like metric for, you know, what is a good, a good level, a good threshold. Um, it doesn't, if we were being really, really picky about it, if we wanted an answer with lots and lots of sig figs, we might say it has to be less than 1% of the starting value. Um, but in general, it's just sort of an arbitrary cutoff. You have to decide somewhere, is that a good assumption? We need, we need a threshold to make that decision. Otherwise it's just everybody, you know, yeah, that looks good enough to me is not really a good enough scientific explanation for why you did something. Um, and so this just removes that subjective quality to it. And then last but not least, how do you know how to finish, how to complete a reaction? How do you know what to write on the product side? Practice, basically. The more exposure you get to a lot of these ideas and the more you see these different reaction types, the more you start to see the patterns and what's, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> um, you start to see those patterns and have a better idea of what to expect, what's most common. And part of it is you never fully know um, until you get more information like, okay, is this going to be an acid-base reaction or is this going to be a precipitation reaction? Well, I can look up acid dissociation constants, Ka values. Oh, Ka is really, really small for this. So it's probably not an acid-base reaction. Therefore, I'm going to look at it like a precipitation reaction. It's not necessarily something that you ever get to the point 
where you can just make it up out of nowhere. Yeah, the most common ones, sure, but not uh, if I get if you've asked me, gave me an unfamiliar reaction and asked me to, what's going to happen, I would still have to go through like, well, is it this? Is it that? Is it that reaction type? Maybe. And then I'd go look up more information, to try and figure out what to write. Um, you're just at the beginning of that journey, your chemical education journey. Um, so it should feel a little bit like you're making stuff up right now. That's normal. All right, let's do some some um, gas law stuff. <laughs> so this is the combined gas law. It's not the complete combined gas law. It still is leaving off one variable. What what's the one variable that react that equation doesn't have? R, but R is not even really a variable. R is a constant. The units on R might tell us though. 206 liters, atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So what variable isn't in there? Moles. So this one, it still says, I took out the lines, I had to retype this um, to fix the numbers. A balloon can be treated like a closed system of gas. Makes sense, right? You put air into a balloon and then you tie it and the, the air stays in there for the most part, right? So we're saying that a balloon is a constant number of moles. The, the complete combined gas law looked like this. Right, and that's the one, that's the ratio that is equal to R for all gases. And if you have this general form, this is the, the form that I'm gonna write on the equation sheet for the test. I'm just gonna show you, I'm not gonna give you all the individual simple gas laws because this has all of them, right? Anything that's constant, anything that's not changing in a gas system is gonna be the same on both sides and it's just gonna cancel out, right? So in this case, if we have a constant number of moles, N1 is equal to N2, right? We can just multiply both sides by N and you wind up with that canceling out. So if we do have all the variables besides N, all we need to know about N is that it's not changing. If N was changing also, then we would need to include N in this as well, and at which point we might as well just be using PV equals NRT. As long as N is constant, we can use this. What do we have to do to start plugging stuff in? I mean, just check our units really, right? But Kelvin, that's the one, even when I'm being nice with the by giving you easy units, still watch out for that Celsius one, right? So what's our initial pressure? What units are pressure? ATM, atmospheres. We know that it doesn't specifically say that that's temperature, but from the units, we can tell that that's temperature, right? And same with volume, it does say volume, but even if it didn't, as long as we know it's liters, we know liters is a volume unit, right? So we can start plugging in 1.05 atmospheres and volume of 5.00 liters. What's 22.0 Celsius in Kelvin? Well, Kelvin is equal to Celsius plus 273.15. So I think that's 295.2. And on the other side, we can fill in everything but pressure, right? We have a new volume. P is P2 is what we're solving for. Our new volume is 
liters. And our new temperature is now 40.5 Celsius. So that's going to be something 0.7 Kelvin to or 313.7, I think. Yeah, that looks right. So now we just solve for P. Easy enough if we know what all the units mean, right? For the units tell you what variable you're going to need to plug it into. What do we get for our final pressure? Five times one point oh five over two ninety five point two times three thirteen point seven over five point oh five. I get one point one oh atmospheres. Just plug and chug, right? Mathematically, it's not too tricky if we can do the algebra. And luckily, the nice thing about gas laws is other than the converting converting into Kelvin, it's an even pretty simple algebra, right? We don't even have to mess with order of operations because everything is multiplication and division, right? So don't overthink it. These gas laws problems aren't too bad as long as you can recognize the units. Does that make sense? If we take a balloon and we leave it in a hot car and the temperature increases, increases, the balloon gets a little bit bigger, the pressure inside the balloon should also go up a little bit too, right? Because what happens when you blow a balloon up? Can you have to use the same amount of force with every breath? It starts getting harder at the end, right? And that's because the, the membrane of the balloon is pushing back harder. It's being stretched more and so it kind of makes sense that the pressure inside the balloon would go up a little bit as the balloon gets bigger um which is lucky because i just made these numbers up and i had a pretty good idea i'm like ah, oh, this all sounds reasonable it should give us an increase in, in pressure and i was right this time i've done this problem before where i messed up the numbers and we've got a pressure decrease but the volume went up and the temperature went up that happens all right, the other skill that we learned the other day is how to use how to use our ideal gas law to get to number of moles. If we have a pressure and a temperature, we can get to moles, which just means we have another way of doing stoichiometry. So what is this reaction? Acetic acid and sodium hydrogen carbonate. What is that? I'll give you a hint. It's a reaction that almost all of you have done at some point. Baking soda and vinegar. We can predict how much baking soda vinegar foam we're going to make by figuring out, okay, if we have excess vinegar and we put 10 grams of baking soda in, how many liters of gas is that going to make? Sounds like a weird way to measure how, many, how much product we get, but it kind of makes sense when we're talking about a gas, right? Think about it like filling up a balloon. How much of a balloon could we fill up? Or how large of a balloon could we fill up with this, with this reaction? What do we have to do to solve that? We need to worry about well, it's, the way it's written should make us think stoichiometry, right? Even if even if we didn't, if we have a starting amount of one chemical and it's asking about, about a final amount of a different chemical, those are all clues that it's a stoichiometry problem. And I made this one relatively easy because we don't need to worry about limiting reactant, right? 
It just says excess vinegar. That just means we're not worried about it running out. We have more than enough vinegar. So what do we have to do? We figure out how many moles of CO2 we make, and then we can plug it in here, right? To figure out how many moles of CO2 we make, what do we have to do? We need to know how many moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. we can get there from mass. So just a molecular weight calculation to get to moles. 10.0 grams of NaHCO3. See, molecular weight of sodium bicarbonate is going to be Sixteen times three is forty-eight. Fifth, sixty, sixty-one, and twenty-three. So is that eighty-four? Yes. And since it's already balanced, we can just plug in. One to one, right? For every one mole NaHCO3 is one mole CO2 produced. All right. Mm, what are we going to get for moles of CO2? Something just under, just above 0 0.1. All right. This next step, there's two approaches. There's the, the simple one that requires more writing or there's the easy one that is a little bit less universal, but it's also pretty handy sometimes. What do we know about gases at standard temperature and pressure? What is standard temperature and pressure for starters? We talked about why standard temperature was so low that ring any bells? Zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. And what about one mole of gas at STP? So STP, standard temperature, is zero Celsius, which is also 273 Kelvin. Standard pressure is one atmosphere. There is a standard conversion for, that converts volume at STP to moles or vice versa. Right. At STP, one mole of any gas is 22.414 liters. So as long as we're at standard temperature and pressure, that means it's just one more, one more conversion. We can just use that as a conversion if we're at standard temperature and pressure. We can just say, okay, well, for every one mole, that's 22.414 liters. Makes it really straightforward. We get something like two, two and a half liters.
of uh, gas that way. It makes sense when you think about how much how much of a mess this reaction makes. You know, 10, 10 grams of baking soda is like a tablespoon, maybe, maybe two tablespoons, not that much. If you dump that into a big jug of vinegar, and you're gonna make almost three liters of get of gas, of bubbles. No wonder it always foams up, right? Um, if you really want it to make it foam up well, you just add dish soap to the vinegar and mix it all up beforehand, and then it, it really foams up well. Yeah. Can you just explain the one mole equals 22.4 liters to everyone? What is, what is that? At what pressure is that at? So that is at standard temperature and pressure, which means zero Celsius, and standard pressure is one atmosphere. And so if you plug in one mole to the PV equals NRT, we say, okay, if our pressure is one atmosphere, the volume we're gonna solve for one mole for N, R is 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres over mole Kelvin. And Temperature is 273.15 Kelvin. We just solve for volume here, we get 22.414. So it's really just a shortcut to, for using PV equals NRT. If we know what the pressure and the, that the pressure and the temperature are of certain standard, that's pretty arbitrary. On our planet, it makes a lot of sense for that to be one atmosphere and zero Celsius. On another planet or another situation, you might have a different standard temperature and pressure. For us though, it's a convenient shortcut because we can just say at, at standard temperature and pressure, we can use this conversion, which makes it just saves us a step. If we didn't want to use that, if that doesn't make sense to you, or if you're, you're struggling with that, just use this instead. This conversion is just a shortcut so that we don't have to stop and plug a bunch of stuff into PV equals NRT, but it is PV equals NRT. So if we said, okay, and then our moles is equal to 0 0.119 and R is still R liters, atmospheres, mole, Kelvin. We just plug that in there and solve for volume. We should get the same answer. We should still get the 2.67 liters. Right, because we'll get volume equals 0 0.119 moles times 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres mole Kelvin. Three point one five Kelvin. All of that over one atmosphere. And really, when we say at STP, we're kind of assuming that it's exactly one atmosphere. That's infinite sig figs. I just keep throwing a bunch of sig figs on it. Um, but we're just assuming that that's an exact number because it's the definition of STP is one atmosphere. And that should give us the 2.67, just like we had before. It's also a pretty decent way to estimate in your head, if you know a reaction is gonna produce so many moles of gas, pretty much almost all of the temperatures and pressures that we're gonna be doing these reactions are relatively close to STP within sig figs. So just being able to say, okay, a mole of gas is about 20 liters that covers a pretty wide range, anything from like really cold and high al altitude all the way down to higher pressures, any, you know, anything under one and a half atmospheres um, up to 
any temperature that humans could survive at is all going to be about 20 liters per mole of gas. As far as being able to estimate in your head, if you wanted just an idea. All right, so is, does everybody see what I meant when I said that there's two ways to solve this? There's the simpler but more writing way, or there's the more limited but faster way. It's more limited because we it only works at standard temperature and pressure, which on your conversion sheet, this one's on there and it says at STP, one mole of gas equals 22.414 liters. Or at least it should, it doesn't say it as, at STP, let me know. which means knowing how gases work means we can also look at some historical things like the Hindenburg. Has everybody heard of the Hindenburg? It's really famous. It's actually more famous for the radio broadcast than it is for the actual disaster itself. Um, if you've ever heard it, anybody jokingly or seriously say, oh, the humanity comes from the radio broadcast from, from the, um, Somebody was watching this and they were broadcasting this big blimp, this big Zeppelin landing in Germany, I think, somewhere in Europe. Um, and it had a hydrogen leak. And then there was this, it got too close to a, um, a tower that it was supposed to dock to and generated a spark. And one spark and a whole bunch of hydrogen and oxygen caused the whole thing to explode. Um, luckily, Zeppelins and blimps are really, really not that efficient as far as how many people they carry. Um, so I want to somebody looked this up for me the other day, and I think it was there's 30 or 50. Was it this class? 36 people is a small number considering how big this blimp is. Um, 97 people on board, 35 killed. There we go, 97 people on board, and that was at capacity. Um, and it had five times 10 to the six, so 5 million cubic feet of hydrogen gas. We can actually figure out how much energy was given off in this explosion, because we can figure out how many moles of hydrogen gas that was. And then if we add a number like, okay, well, the combustion of hydrogen is this many kilojoules per mole, we could actually get a number for how many kilojoules were released in that. Um, but with these gases, Unless there's a change, if there's a change, you're using one of those simple gas laws where you look at P1, V1, and P2, V2. Otherwise, if it's just a matter of how many moles or trying to figure out how many liters from the moles, everything's going to come back to this when it comes to gases. Now, does anybody remember what we called this besides PV equals NRT? The official name was the ideal gas law, which always seemed like a weird name. How do, how do you decide whether or not an, a law is ideal? Um, until I realized it's not the ideal gas law, it's the ideal gas law. It's talking about the gas is ideal, not the law, which is still seems a little bit weird. What makes it something an ideal gas? What would change whether or not this worked? Like if we figured out, if we figured out we had, you know, however many moles of water vapor at say, uh, I don't know, minus a hundred Celsius. What are we assuming about that water vapor if we're gonna try and use this equation? What does water vapor do when you get it cold? It condenses, right? It doesn't stay as water vapor. Does this take that into account? This is making some assumptions and those assumptions were assuming everything's going to behave as an ideal gas. Right? And an ideal gas has two, we're making two really important assumptions. The first one, is that there's no phase changes. 
And really more, more generally, we could say no intermolecular forces. In other words, when the gas molecules bump into each other or bump into the side of the container, they bounce right off like, like playing pool. When, if you hit the cue ball into an, into another, into the eight ball, it doesn't like, it's not soft, right? They hit and all the momentum is transferred. And again, it's been a really long time since I had physics. So I don't remember if that's, does that mean it make it elastic? Is that an elastic collision? Or an inelastic. Who's had physics recently? Yep. Perfectly elastic if it bounces off perfectly, right? Okay. So we're assuming everything is perfectly elastic. If we actually, if we had something, um, so if we threw two ping pong balls at each other, they're going to bounce off perfectly elastic, more or less, right? If we threw two, um, I don't know, water balloons at each other. That's not going to be a perfect, even if they didn't pop, that's not going to be perfectly elastic, right? Because they're going to distort their shape. They're going to, it's going to get all weird and tangled up. Um, we're assuming nothing like that happens. We're assuming that our gas molecules, when they bump into each other, it's perfectly elastic. They just bounce off with no interactions, which also means no phase changes. Phase changes happen when there's attractive forces between molecules. If you, if you slow water molecules down enough, the fact that they're polar means that they have some attractive forces between them. And that can make them go from being a gas to being a liquid or a liquid to a solid. Um, if we have no intermolecular forces, that means also that there will be no phase changes, which is nice because that means that's one less thing we have to worry about when it comes to these gas laws, right? The other assumption well, let's see if we can look it out together. If we looked at that graph of volume versus temperature, actually, let me switch these axes. Let's say we could com we're controlling the temperature and we're watching the volume of a gas. As your temperature goes down, the volume should go down, right? And every time you cut it in half, you get half the volume. It's, it's directly proportional, which means if we could get to zero Kelvin, what would the volume of our gas be? Zero. Can we have a gas with a volume of zero? Why not? Because matter takes up space and because then it wouldn't, those are both the right answers for different reasons. If, if we actually got to the point where um, the, it wouldn't be a gas because when you pack molecules in tightly, it starts behaving more like a liquid. And two, matter takes up space. The gas molecules themselves take up space. So we're assuming that this equation works because it's pretty good from about like here up to infinity basically but it breaks down when you get to the point where they're where your gas molecules themselves are taking up a significant amount of space so the other assumption is the gas molecules have zero volume which under normal circumstances that's a decent assumption. They still have volume, but when we're talking about, if we're talking about one liter of volume at one atmosphere of pressure, the gas molecules might be taking up, I don't know, like a hundredth of a milliliter, maybe. That even seems too high. Gases are almost entirely empty space. So the amount of space that these tiny gas molecules take up is really, really small. So for the most part, this is a good assumption. 
for the most part, both of these are a good assumption. If there's if there's so much empty space in in a gas, what are the odds that a gas molecule runs into another gas molecule? Not quite zero, but really close. Um, if you want to get the how often it takes or how often gas molecules run into each other, if you said that a you shrunk us down to the size of a gas molecule so we could observe this. It would be like the distance from here to Jupiter is the amount it is the distance that a gas molecule has to travel before it actually would run into another gas molecule. So in other words, they really don't run into each other very often. And that's at one atmosphere at, uh, at STP. Um, <clears throat> So, but both there are places where both of these assumptions break down and they tend to be at the same place when you have way more gas molecules than you have space when you have more gas molecules than empty space they start bumping into each other more often and they're taking up a significant portion of the of that space right so how am I gonna ask you questions about that? Well, on the test, I could do something like explain what the two assumptions are and where they fall apart. I'm not gonna ask you to do any of the math with this necessarily, but understanding that these assumptions exist and where they fall apart is important. Anytime you're getting close to a phase change, this is gonna fall apart, right? Because then this isn't true. Anytime you get to really, really small volume or really, really high concentrations of, of um, gases, this one falls apart and this one falls apart. Well, if we have this really simple generic equation that works most of the time, but we have a list of the, the assumptions that we made and where they fall apart, What's the next logical thing for a scientist or a theor a um, physicist to do? What do you do when you find holes in your scientific theory? You figure out why, which we did we just did. Then what do we do? We fix it. We patch it. Basically, we don't usually even really change. I guess we do change the law. Um, but we're not really changing it so much as we're saying, okay, but in these circumstances, you might want to take this into consideration as well. We deal with layers of complexity, right? This is good for almost all layers of complexity when we're dealing with gases, but under circum some circumstances, we add some corrections to it. These corrections um, are in the same general form Um, but it's, we don't call it the ideal gas law because we're taking into account the fact that it's not an ideal gas. So we have Van der Waals gas equation. Um, the Van der Waals gas equation still looks like PV equals NRT, just with a couple of extra terms mixed in. Believe it or not, that still does look like PV equals NRT. It's still got a pressure term times a volume term equals NRT. But these two corrections, this plus A times N over V squared and the minus NB term show up. What does that fix, really? Well, the simpler term to look at is that volume term, right? What is that volume term doing? Yeah, we have moles. There's this B term, it's just a constant we have to look up. It's gonna be different for every gas, but N is how many moles you have still. So our total volume minus your moles of the gas times the constant. That constant is basically how much space does that do the gas molecules themselves take up? 
So this is just saying, okay, well, we have 10 liters, but really if the gas molecules are taking up one milliliter of that 10, milli 10 liters, it's really 9.9999 liters, which kind of makes sense. It's a, a pain to deal with that. Now our nice clean equation has these extra terms and stuff we have to go look up. Um, B is, this equation is used so little that it's actually kind of hard to find the corrective term. You have to like, okay, nitrogen has a different B value than water does. And they're both different than say argon. Every different gas is gonna have its own B term, which is really annoying, right? Scientists in general, especially chemists and physicists, don't like having to go look up random arbitrary numbers. We like nice clean equations. So if this term is taking into account gas molecules have zero volume, this term must be the other assumption, right? N over V squared. In other words, moles per liter, a concentration squared. Basically, this is taking into account what are the what is the um, probability that two gas molecules run into each other, and then A just is what happens when they do. Are they really strongly attracted to each other or not? If it's a totally perfectly elastic collision, A is zero because they have no interactions. And if A is zero, this whole term goes away. So. As far as I'm in general, I'm not going to have you do a whole lot with this because this is also a really, really is kind of a beast of an equation to solve as well. Um, because we've got a quadratic term, we've got all these, we have to foil these two after we square them, then try to separate terms. If you want to try and solve for volume or moles, this is a really, really nasty equation. You basically, I would only ask you that to do solve for volume or moles if you had a solver because you're just gonna get bogged down in how the heck do I actually solve this and separate all these terms. Um, but pressure, temperature um, are not too bad to solve for. So if you had all the pieces for it, it's just a matter of plugging things in. It's just plug and chug, it's just there's more pieces of it. So it's more of a pain. But I have to give you A and B or I have to let you look up A and B for these. Um, and you're, there is a whole <laughs> table of so Van der Waals constants for common gases. So you have, you know, okay, helium, neon, argon. Those noble gases shouldn't have much interactions with each other, right? So their A term should be pretty small. But then they might, as you get bigger and bigger, you see this B term gets big, gets bigger and bigger. And the units on B kind of make sense too. Instead of moles per liter, B is in liters per mole. In other words, if you had, say, liquid nitrogen, if you know how much um, liquid nitrogen you have in terms of moles, you can figure out how much space it's going to take up. And that's what this B term is. It's just liters per mole of gas. The other thing that's really obnoxious about this, though, is we haven't really talked about mixtures of gases yet, have we? If your gas molecules hardly ever run into each other, does it really matter what the gas is under normal circumstances? Does this have any place for us to plug in, whether we're talking about CO2 or helium? If they're never running into each other, does it matter what the gas is? This N is really just total moles of all gas in a mixture. Right, which is also why in your gas laws lab last week, it didn't really matter that we were taking the atmosphere, which is a mixture of gases, and trapping it all. Because it doesn't matter that it's a mixture if they're never running into each other. However, if they are running into each other, if A is significant and N over B is significant, this really doesn't even tell the whole story here, right? Because if you had a mixture of, say, um, water and CO2, those water is going to interact with water one way, CO2 interacts with CO2 one way, 
water interacting with CO2 is going to be a third different way they can interact, right? So basically, this equation only works if we're talking about one gas at a time. As soon as it's a mixture of gases, it gets exponentially more complicated because you have three different A terms. It would be A1 moles of, of water over volume times moles of CO2 over volume plus A2. You can see where that's going, right? As you, in, and that's just a two component system, something like the atmosphere that's 10 different gases mixed together would really, really be a pain. And I don't even know where you'd be able to find those. I don't even know where they could keep tables of A values for mixtures of gases. I mean, there must be some somewhere. But the nice thing is, is under, up, up till you get to about 10 pressures or 10 atmospheres. And as long as you stay away from phase changes, this is all you have to worry about. Until you get to about 10 atmospheres of pressure, that equation will give you within sig figs the same answer as this equation for a whole lot more work. So in general, stick with this, understand this, at least in general in concepts. I don't want to solve that one right now. Does everybody see how we would be able to solve it though? One mole. That just means, the fact, we've got N on both sides now just means you're going to plug that N in in a bunch of different places, right? The fact that it's water tells you you go to your table and you find water. A value of 5.46, B value of 0.0305. So that's what you're going to plug in for A and B. Volume, you're given a volume. A convenient volume too, 22.414, right? So this should be one atmosphere of pressure exactly. So I picked all the numbers to make it come out to be one atmosphere of pressure. It'll actually wind up being slightly, slightly less than one atmosphere of pressure, but within sig figs, the same number. Oh, fine. You convinced me. Let's do the math. Solving for P. A is what I'd say was 5.46. I'm not writing the units this time. That's a bad habit to be in. But for this one, with all of this writing, we're just going to go with it. 1.0000 over 22.414. Volume still 22.414. 1.0000 moles. I couldn't even do it. I said I wasn't going to write the units, but I can't help myself. Um, Where's our point zero three oh five? All of that equals one point zero 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 times point zero eight two oh six times two seventy three point one five. This is going to come out to be 22.414 over 22.414 minus 0 0.0305 over 22.414. I get pressure plus 5.46 times one over 22.414 equals 0.9986. And then we're gonna subtract a little bit more. <clears throat> 
is five times one over 22.414. So nine, nine, eight, six minus answer. Oh, I forgot the squared term, that's why. All right. If you're waiting on an answer for this, 0.05, I get something like 0.94, which even that seems a little bit high. So maybe I missed another squared term somewhere. Oh, I squared the five as well. Basically, well, what the point is of doing this is one, it's practice using the equation, but the other thing is just pointing out how tiny these correction terms are. After doing all that extra work, we're gonna get something still really, really close to one atmosphere. If you're only looking for three or four sig figs, it's almost always fine to just use this, unless you're really high concentrations. All right, have a good one, everybody. You too. I had a question.